Okay, so our first speaker tonight is John from Strategic Apps. Thanks a lot, Eddie. Um, good evening, everybody. Hi, it's nice to be here. Um, I want to talk to you for a short time this evening about um, what we're doing as a business. My company is Strategic Apps. Um, we are a software development company and we've done most of our work in financial services over the last few years. We're in an interesting space at the moment because we're moving from being a services company to a product-based company, um, which I know is the kind of holy grail for a lot of services companies. So I thought it might be interesting to just talk to you briefly tonight about the experience that we've had in spotting an opportunity in the fintech space and developing a product around it and then um, changing our business model from services to product and uh, you know what kind of um, experience we've had with that. So hopefully that will be somewhat interesting for you tonight. So um, compliance. We uh, focus on the area of financial services compliance. Um, it's obviously uh, what some people think of as a necessary evil. So you're operating in fintech and you know there's a lot of compliance that you have to, um, you know, have a lot of regulation that you have to comply with. Uh, it's often a bit of a journey to find out what regulation applies to your firm and what rules you have to, uh, to tick off. And then you've got the challenge of putting in processes and controls within your firm to make sure that you can evidence the compliance that you've, that you've followed. Um, we don't need any reminder about why there's such a, an emphasis on compliance in the last few years. Obviously, we've come from um, the, the biggest financial crisis since the 1930s. Um, the, uh, the large banks lost a trillion dollars worth on toxic assets, um, particularly around loans um, and uh, complex instruments over that period. Um, and the government response in the UK was to pass the uh, Financial Services Act on the 1st of April, came into force, and we set up the FCA to replace the old financial services um, regulator. And we also set up the PRA um, at the Bank of England as well. So the, uh, the work that we do is around the FCA and helping firms comply with the regulations that they need to, um, to meet under the FCA regime. Um, so the burden is quite extreme, uh, as you probably know if you're setting up a fintech company. Um, there was a, an interesting um, survey that was done by State Street, the big custody bank, uh, quite recently. And they looked at the way that financial services firms are using data, and one of the categories that they looked at was compliance. And what they found was that nine in 10 investment organizations that they surveyed, and they surveyed 400 organizations across 11 countries, um, nine out of 10 of those said that they expected the reporting requirements to increase um, over the next three years. And, and half of those said that their data processing and their, their um, controls would struggle to keep up with that. So that looks to us like a big opportunity to help financial firms meet their obligations. Um, these were some of the uh, stats that came out of a, a Reuters survey. Um, the, over the next 12 months, for example, uh, the um, senior um, uh, directors were saying that they expected the cost of um, compliance staff to be uh, significantly more or slightly more than today. That was over 50%. Um, the, uh, the opinion is that the compliance team budget over the next 12 months is going to increase either slightly or, or uh, a great deal. A um, couple of other charts. The, the personal liability, this is an interesting one for us because we focus on the area of client assets and looking after client money. And um, there's a controlled function within uh, financial firms that hold client money, which some of you may know about, called the CF10A role. And, if, and this is an individual who's usually on the board. And if, they find, if the regulator finds that the regulations haven't been followed correctly, then the CF10A can be sent to jail. So there's an, a, an increase in personal liability that's come off the back of the, um, the changes with the FCA, which makes um, selling to that sector quite interesting because you can use that as one of the perks of your product that, you know, if you work with us, then you're less likely to be sent to jail, <laughs> which is uh, quite an interesting perk. Um, so a few more stats. Uh, compliance teams spending more than seven hours a week meeting regulatory requirements. Um, and how much time does your compliance team spend creating and amending reports for the board? This is an interesting one because, you know, reporting and charting technology, it's been around for a long time. It's quite easy to automate charting and reporting. Um, and yet some of the biggest firms in the country that we speak to are still doing a lot of manual processes in the back office to produce board reports. Um, and it was interesting that the data picked, picked that up. 
So what's our diagnosis of the, of the problem? Why, why are firms finding it so onerous to comply with the regulation? Um, one of the reasons is that the FCA are uh, notoriously um, reluctant to elaborate on the policy statements that they give out. So they will engage with on financial entrepreneurs on the face of it, but the advice often boils down to, well, if you'd like to know more about X, then please see policy statement 14 slash 9, clause 3. And you're left thinking, well, do I actually know anything more than I did before I spoke to the FCA? <laughs> and often the answer is, answer is no. Um, and I think it's a deliberate, deliberate policy by the FCA because they want the firms to, um, to kind of have that internal struggle with the regulation and they want, them to, they want the firms to work out how can I modify my own business and my processes and controls to comply with <laughs> regulations. So they kind of want you to invent the process that you're going to follow. Um, there's a, there's a kind of mini industry um, that we participate in where there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer discussion about best practice and regulation. So we go to a lot of the conferences where these types of challenges are discussed. Um, and there are you know, small presentations just like this to a similar number of people about what the best practices are for solutions within compliance. You get the external um, consultants as well, which is quite an expensive approach, but a lot of firms <laughs> use that. Um, you can get advice from auditors like PwC and um, uh, Deloitte and so on, but they'll often qualify their advice very heavily. So they're a bit better than the FCA, but they'll still be quite general in the advice that they give you because they can't be seen to favour one firm over another. Um, so there's lots of reinvention of the wheel, and this was the opportunity that we saw that we wanted to address as a firm. Um, so what's our leverage? Why strategic apps? Why did we want to get involved in this area? Well, we've done a lot of bespoke development work for financial firms around the kinds of areas that I've listed up there. So we've developed um, a, a, a KYC client onboarding web portal for a brokerage. Um, we uh, created risk management systems um, for a, 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 another brokerage. Um, we've done quite a lot of work in um, doing int intraday reconciliations for firms, so finding out what the exposure of a firm is at any point in time during a, um, a, a trading day, which is quite interesting, and we've done post-trade data integration. So we found that we were in a position where we knew quite a lot about the technical challenges within the back office, and we could bring this together with the compliance challenge and see you know, if that was an area where we could make some successful business. Um, we're also involved in the, uh, in the conference circuit, like I said, and um, I've run quite a few workshops uh, second half of last year and this year, um, advising firms on how they can use IT and uh, software development to address the compliance function. Um, and we've built up some good relationships with consultants uh, as part of that experience. So um, obviously automating compliance is a massive challenge and it's not one that we would say that we could ever address in its entirety. Um, we've chosen a, a beachhead or a, a niche that we're targeting, which is the client money rules. Um, this, this was the, uh, one of the areas where Lehman Brothers became really unstuck in the financial crisis. And uh, um, there's a lot of interest in how you can better segregate the firm's money from the client's money. Um, there are also 600 firms which you can get from the FCA who are regulated under uh, the CAS rules, as they say. So our audience was quite uh, easy to identify. Um, there's a guy in each of those firms who's going to be sent to jail if they don't do this compliance properly. So uh, we thought, well, there's our target market, pretty well defined. Um, and there have been some high profile fines as well for firms that haven't followed the, um, the regulation properly. Um, so here was just a few of them. Uh, SEI were fined 900,000. Um, Aberdeen fined 9 million. Barclays Bank were fined 37 million for not complying with client money regulation. So that was quite a high profile um, uh, failure. So the, the product that we developed, have developed, is, is called Cast Director, which is um, a piece <coughs> of software which allows the CF10A and his team to comply with client money regulation. Um, when we approached the uh, strategy, we followed the crossing the chasm methodology, um, which some of you may have heard of. Has, any, has anybody come across that before? Jeffrey Moore? Yeah. It's, um, it's quite an interesting way of analysing your product in terms of generic, extended, augmented and potential. Um, so in our terms, our generic product is a, um, a SaaS product, which is kind of like, it's a workflow product basically. It's highly configurable, but it allows different um, people in the back office to edit and um, add uh, different data records and they can update those, they can, um, uh, they can query those. 
they can um, check back the data they've added to the system against the regulation and show that there's a tick back between regulatory um, clauses and the data that they've added and the workflow that they're following. Um, so, so far, so, so standard. The expected product is like, what do our clients need in order to um, get the benefit from what we're offering? So it's the generic software that we provide plus some consultancy and some guided content. So it's kind of a, a step-by-step -step process. Um, we sometimes talk about CAS in a box, which is like instead of reading the CAS manual, which is about you know um, sort of uh, five chapters long and um, sort of hundreds and, and thousands of clauses, instead of doing that, you can use a web app which allows you to step through different screens and it tells you what to do at each stage, uh, what contracts you need to post up there and what information needs to be logged. So it's kind of like a, a hand-holding process which is a lot easier for firms to engage with. Our augmented product is that we, um, we've modularized our software. So there are modules for the different areas of regulation within CAS. Um, one of them is a living will, like a resolution pack. So if your firm goes bust, then this information tells the um, practitioner where to get the client money from and how to give it back to the clients. So we've got a module for that. And we've got one for trust letters as well, which is um, uh, a contract you have to have in place with the bank when you're holding segregated <coughs> money. Um, and there's a few others as well, but that modular approach seemed to tick a lot of boxes. Um, and it meant that we could price them in a way where senior directors can sign off a budget without having to go through a whole board approval process as well. So you can actually sell quite an expensive piece of software in small, um, relatively small bite-sized chunks. So that was quite interesting um, for us. Um, and in terms of the potential product, this is where we've, um, we've got ambitions to do a lot more best practice sharing through the platform. So the idea that instead of reinventing the wheel and having to pay you know, the, the same kind of cohort of external consultants to tell you the same thing that they're telling all of your competitors, it would be nice if there was a way to share that best practice in terms of templates that, um, that could ultimately be, be rated and could be discussed uh, online by compliance professionals. Um, so we launched the marketing and the product back in uh, Q4 last year. So we did um, a conference, an info line conference to promote the product. Um, so I shared a platform with a CF10A and one of the, um, the leading CAS consultants in the, in the UK, which gave us a lot of credibility straight away. Um, we, did, we had to sponsor that conference, and I must admit, I did feel like a bit of a fraud at first that I was getting in front of like 120 delegates who knew a lot more than I did about compliance, and yet we were the, uh, one of the gold sponsors of the event. But if any of you guys are considering doing something like that, I would say definitely go for it. You know, the, the, the sponsorship. Is, it has been a very a, a good route for us and it just makes that association um, between your product and your services and a particular field. Um, so it's worked out well. Um, so we've done various other things, mostly around conference and networking. We achieved our first sale, so we were able to sell the product to a stockbroker who's, um, who's working with us on an annual license basis. So that was a big breakthrough for us. We were used to doing time and materials projects um, and, and now we've got uh, annual licenses that we, that we sell. So that's uh, for any of you that's, that run development teams or run agencies, then you know how, how important it is if you can make that transition. Um, so we've built up an advisory team so we can surround the product with the consultancy that uh, I mentioned earlier. And we've got a strong pipeline, so we're now talking to top tier banks who, who are interested in how they can save a lot of money and headache by automating the back office. And I can say that there's kind of a correlation between the bigger the firm, the, 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 the more inefficient their back office processes tend to be. So um, consequently, the business model is more compelling for the bigger firms. It's a bigger project to implement it, but you can, um, you can make great savings for those guys. Uh, so it's, it's um, a, a very promising area for us. Um, so yeah, we've got a, a product website, Cast Director, and we've got a, um, a WordPress blog where we just post interesting stuff about using technology to apply to the comp compliance space. And we have guest bloggers on there as well, so CF10As that have kept out of jail by using um, smart approaches to compliance contribute to our blog as well, so that's nice. Um, yeah, so that's, that's our story, and uh, you know, hopefully it will continue in that vein. Thanks. I do think where, where there's compliance, there's lots of money to be made in automating compliance. Um, any questions for John? I don't really understand what's complicated about keeping client money separate, because you just put it in a different account, surely. So how can you get fined £37 million for screwing that up? It seems pretty basic. 
Yeah, that was, um, that's a good question. And that, that was, <laughs> I'm glad that was, of that. I thought it was a really stupid question. No, no, <laughs> it, it's a good question because we were asking similar questions um, when we came, in, came to the field. The, the fact is that the rules are actually quite simple on the face of it. So when you read um, what the FCA write, you can think, well, that can't be that hard. You know, we need a contract for each client money bank account to say that that money is not the firm's money, it's the client's money. How hard can it be? And if you've got less than 10 bank accounts, then it might be pretty easy to get that right using a Word document um, and storing files on a, on a disk. One of our clients has got um, 17,000 trust letters that they have to maintain. Um, and they're opening up to 20 bank accounts on a, on a daily basis because they're trading client money with segregated accounts for each client. And they do a lot of wealth management. So they've got, and they've got a lot of clients. So to comply with the regulation in that case, it's obviously it's the other end of the scale, but that gets extremely tricky. And um, in that case, there used to be a grace period. So before, um, well, it's this, the grace period is still in place right now, but as of the 1st of June this year, the, the grace period of 20 days um, where you can trade from a segregated account without having the contract in place has been removed. So in the past, the FCA were quite relaxed and they were like, yeah, yeah, you can, you know, trade with the client's money. As long as you get the trust letters in place in 20 days, then we're fine with that. And now they're saying there's no grace. So if they find that you're trading from one of those accounts from 17,000 without the right paperwork, then you're in trouble. So th that's where the tools can be quite helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. John. Thanks, everyone.